All right, guys, I'm sitting here with the legendary Mark Armstrong from Ice Fire Systems and Handmade Jigs. And uh, we're going to go over a couple things today. We're going to start a little bit here with ice safety. What do you want to tell the people, Mark? Well, when you're in clear waters like this, and we're in drinking water, you have four inches of ice, three to four inches of good clear ice. It's usually very safe, very safe to walk on. But in the springtime, as the ice starts to melt, getting off the lake can be a real issue. And Benny can attest to that. Oh, yeah. And so can I. But uh, so watch the ice, you know, shallower lakes, lower altitudes, more algae in the water. The ice isn't quite as sturdy, isn't quite as safe. You want to make it a little thicker before you venture out on that. But uh, really watch the ice. That's the number one thing. And then go have fun. So as Mark said, ice safety is a huge part of ice fishing, so make sure you guys are staying safe out there and look for the signs. Um, so this hut we're sitting in, Mark, it's kind of a windbreak you got here. How long have you been creating these things? <laughs> Well, the minute I set out on a bucket one day in South Park, I mine just started working because I couldn't read my rods. Uh, rods were bobbing. I didn't want to tow the hut out, a big black hut. So uh, I'd say probably back in the late 70s, I started inventing these things. I just first started with a board to break it around me, a 4x4 four four board. And then got to thinking, well, there's got to be a better way. So after about a dozen uh, trials and errors each season, I finally came up with this little thing here. And it's almost like a home away from home. Underneath is a hot box, and that's solar heated just from this hut being painted with flex seal, black flex seal. It floats. I hope I never need it. And then... Uh, I've got everything I need inside it. You know, I've got a barometer, a temperature gauge, uh, a mount for my uh, GoPro, uh, weather radio, two-way radios, um, all my lures. It's just everything I need. And if I don't want fish to freeze, if I bring a few home, I put them down in the hot box down here. It breaks the wind around my rods so I can enjoy days like this without confining myself to a little blackout hut. Because Wyoming is just too beautiful to uh, let go. And then you just bring a pair of binoculars up. You can see elk, deer, uh, what other fishermen are doing, if they're catching, if they're not. So you're really sucking in Wyoming this way. I've, I have a blackout hut. I've had to use it very little. Right now the temperature is 63 degrees in here. And it's 31 outside. So it's solar. And when you adjust these cover the doors for this thing, it reflects in. And on the back, there's a set of split skis. So I just lower this down, and it pulls right in in the back of my rig. So it's quick and easy. It, it lets you not feel the wind. I'll have to admit, on cloudy days where I don't have solar, it... Uh, it's just it's cold, as long as, but you don't have the wind hitting you, so you don't have that temperature increase. So I can attest, guys, this thing blocks the wind perfectly. It heats up from being black. He's got the skis. It slides like a dream, and it's very lightweight. I mean, this is an awesome rig that Mr. Mark's been creating for how many years now? Uh, close to 40. Close to 40 years Mr. Mark's been making these. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about is a little bit about minimizing your time out here on your ice fishing missions, just being on the ice and making sure you're making the most of your time. And that's what I've tried to do with this hut, because up top there's rod holders, and I always have the jigs tied on before I go out in the evening or go out in the morning and fish. So the only thing I have to do is tip the jigs. I just tip it up and I'm fishing. 
and I don't have to worry if I come out in a heavy wind, setting up a big Eskimo hut by myself. The thing would be in Nebraska by the time I was done. So with this, I just have me a real windy. I got a couple of ice screws I put in on the back, and it's like a little bus stop out here. So minimize your time. The quicker you can be fishing, get you know sun up. That's a real prime time. The quicker you can be fishing, the better. You you spend another half an hour getting everything set up, pounding, drilling. You got a lot of fish you're missing out on. So, you know, if it's a no-wind day, grab a bucket, come out, and just fish, because you're in the water real quick that way. So, like Mark was saying, he slides this thing out. It slides like a dream on the skis. He pops the thing open, he drills a couple holes, and boom, his rods are in rod holders right on the top of this thing, and he drops jigs in within minutes of being on the lake. So, minimizing your time to be able to catch more fish and be there during the hot bite is very important. So, Mark, why don't we talk a little bit about your ice fire system you've got here, the rods and reels. Cool. Yeah. I've lost so many fish over the years with conventional summertime reels and up until just recently nobody's really thought about why we need a reel just for ice fishing. And there's been a few companies come out with reels that look like fly reels that hang underneath, but it's still exposed line to the element. So I looked around and I designed and built and chopped up multiple reels till I ran into these reels here and these rods. Now the rods are about three feet, uh, four inches long. And uh, I've got a piano wire on the end to detect the slight little minute strikes that these lethargic bigger fish project to the wire. You can see with these wires on a day like this, the fish just swims by. The current makes them go. And once you learn these, it's, it's real quick and easy. So what I'm doing is I invented a little system that eliminates line twist. And we can go into a long story about line twist, but anytime you use a drag on a reel, other than a fly reel or a bait caster, using the drag you're creating line twist. And you're reeling it back in, twist it, and then it goes out again. Then you gotta reach up here and loosen the drag. These, you don't have to do it. When a fish runs on an open face, he doesn't get a good straight run because it tightens up. That's why you see people loosening the drag. Why mess with that? You're, you can detect that off of your index finger. So as what I've done is when the line is wound on, it does get twisted because it's a spool facing forward. So it twists it, one twist for every revolution that comes on. So as what I've done is invented a way to untwist it, which is very simplistic. A lot of you bake, a lot of you spin fishermen will back reel your reels to have better control and eliminate line twist. With these, is what I've done is in put a kick off, extended kickoff lever here on the side of the reel. And then where the reversible screw is to put the handle right side, left side, I've incorporated a little wheel. So when you kick this thing down and the drag is just set to zip and not no more. So you set your strike, you kick this down, your finger lays right there lightly and you control the run of the fish. And you never really have to put pressure on it to stop them. It's like putting a horse on a, uh, a tire on a horse in a field and swatting him to break his spirits. And he'll just run until he tires out. Well, that's basically what we're doing. We don't, these fish we're catching up to you know, 24, 25, 26 inches, just make a 30 yard run and they stop. But they're going straight away because you're allowing 
getting them to go straight away. So they're wiggling that jig hook up in there. When you hook these fish, you want to get them away from the hole as long as you can. And that you enjoy the fight, you enjoy the runs, and the fish tires and it'll actually drop its tail, come up the hole. And you can still release them quite fine. So basically when this, this rod is doubled up, like so, I can approach the hole just like I had a short one there, but it's dampening the shock. And what this is not doing, this little wheel also helps the rod, because it gives it a quarter turn, half turn, quarter turn, as that big fish shakes its head from side to side. And uh, so total control. I am not freezing line in the spool like you can with an open face. If it's a cold, windy day, and you come up five feet, frozen line freezes to the non-frozen line, and you go to set the stripe and wonder, why did I just snap off, you know? So that's the thing I've invented, the rod savers here. Now, briefly going to the system, these spring, if the rod's drug down the hole, if you're eating a sandwich or going to the bathroom, they spring out. The system is designed to teeter-totter. So, and Benny just was out deeper with me and he looked back and his rod was doing this. It's like, and then I'll give a brief explanation. If you're walking down, the sidewalk, there's a big weeping willet tree there, and you've got a laser hook hanging off one of them willows. And that fish come, that I mean, you walk by, and it barely catches your ear right here. You'll take three or four steps before you realize, as the pressure increases, that you're hooked. So you'll back up a little bit and pull it out. Well, when a fish does that, this gradual pressure system, they they don't know where dead center is. So it'll pull it out just a ways and give you time to set the strike when they come by. So, you know, you don't need a jaw jacker, but I use them. But it, these are just as much fun because you're testing your reflexes. Keeping two holes always, no more than three feet apart in your peripheral vision. That's so important, because you can play the fish. Lures are both at the same depth, so you can play them back and forth, and one wire may bip, and then you'll miss him. You go immediately over to the other one, that one will drop. So it's a, it's a game that you play. It's not like you're just bait fishing. You know, this is it's intricate as fly fishing. And uh, so these rods maintain pressure from zero pressure to two and a half ounces. At two and a half ounces, it touches the ice. That gives a bigger fish are moving slower, you know. And, and smaller fish are boogieing quicker. You'll see a quick rod drop for a smaller fish. These bigger ones, you'll just see a nice little curve. I can attest, I've caught a few fish on these, and the wheel on the side, creating your own drag is a ton of fun, and it allows you to really play that fish versus, you know, maybe your drag locks up and you break off a fish. That doesn't happen with this system. So next, Mark, we're going to talk a little bit about your hand-tied, hand-crafted, ice-fired jigs that have hmm. been working for many, many years for him. Let's see. Uh, uh, back in the 70s at uh, 11 Mile in Ontario, I was out there trying to power bait and worms and salmon eggs. I've got to catch these fish. They, they eat it in the summer. Why aren't they eating in the winter? And uh, they weren't. You know, you'd spend a whole day out there and not catch a darn thing. I seen an old timer at Ontario one year using a jig called a flea fly, non-fluorescent. The eye came out at a 45 on the head, so it wouldn't lay lateral, you know, in the water. And he was jigging and just slaying fish at Ontario. And then I learned about fluorescence. I learned about a good crappie jig, collarless, and started tying in fluorescence from 180th ounce size to uh, one uh, 
uh, 132nd pound size, so I got a 64th in in the middle, just three sizes. You know, uh, there's days where they're finicky, little 180ths or better. You know, and then there's days where they're real aggressive, and you can hook them with a bigger jig, a bigger target. See it from a little further. Um, the heads, I put aluminum paint on it years ago, and the heads glow in the dark. Um, sometimes I'll make the eyes glow. Um, they're all fluorescent. And fluorescent paint is definitely not clear, but light goes through it, so you always have to have a white primer underneath it. So various colors, depending on their mood, it brings them in. We're tipping it with anything you want, from maggots to mealworms, sometimes shrimp. Heard about people tipping their jig with a night crawler, you know. They just want to get them in, and these colors here will, will actually get them in. And, there's the bigger sizes. These are 32nd ounce. But you know, it's all bigger the size, the bigger the hook shank. And if you've got a real light line, some guys are using four pound tests, trying to put a hook in a, some of these bigger fish's mouths here is tough. But I'm gonna jump back real quick. You can with these reels and rods when they make their run away from the hole because that way it's wiggling it in as they're wiggling their butt out there. So a good run just basically assures you you've got a hood hook set. But if you don't get those fish to run and you try to bring them in, they'll back the jig out on the bottom of the hole because they're too hot. They can scar themselves up and you're most likely going to lose a big fish. So. Just remember, have fun. Let them run. They're not getting away. They're gonna get away if you try to bring them in quick. You think? Yeah. <laughs> and it's never fun losing a big fish. It'll stain you for days, weeks, maybe even years. So Mark, next I want to talk a little bit about how you got your holes placed and what size you like to use. Well, problem with the, I use 10 inch holes. Problem with 10 inch holes, if you're not watching where you're walking, your foot will more than likely go through there unless you're Bigfoot. And I've stepped in a couple of my holes before all the way up to my crotch. And that really puts a bad shine on that day. So 10 inch holes, for the fish that we get, oh my gosh, absolutely. Eight inch hole, you really gotta get your fish to run to drop that tail to come up that 80. Little plus on an eight inch hole, they're not turning around and going back down. So if you get a specific size fish and it's big, when you get them corralled in that eight inch hole, you can get an arm down in there and land them. These holes are always cut within my peripheral vision. So if they come in and I miss one, that fish thought something just got away from it and it's in the chase mode, spins around and it sees this uh, rod here. And it comes over and takes it. So it's a gamut game, back and forth. Jigs the same depth all the time because one works for the other and vice versa. They don't want one color, they'll come over for the other. When you start getting a little bit more mature in your years, I remember my father's words saying, Mark, don't invest in your own misery. Me running across that ice in my 70s today would call for flight for life and a broken hip. So I try to keep it within reason, you know, so I can get to them. But the, Bring some cleats, my gosh. If you don't have cleats, you're gonna get acquainted to this shiny stuff real quick. So did you wanna do anything about the game and fish or no? This is what I'm so proud of about living in Wyoming, especially Albany County area. 
they have a team of biologists here that manage, stock, evaluate these fisheries on a regular basis. And these guys are in constant battle with 100-year-old water rights, uh, lakes dropping, losing their fish, uh, temperature, winter kill, and the list goes on. So they go one step forward and four back. But they have made the best fisheries around here that equal Alaska. And Benny can attest to that because he was here fly fishing with me last spring. And we had many fish were eight pounds. And you can't do that unless you got your ducks in a row. So keep that in mind, guys. We got a great biologist team here. Yeah, so I can definitely tell you that the fishing and the quality of fish here is just really next level. I mean, I caught some of my personal best seven, eight pound rainbows and colored up beautiful kite jaws. And we had a hundred fish day one time, and I'm sure you guys saw that episode too. And if you haven't, go back quite a few videos and you'll see me, Mark, and his son, Scott, holding up 30, 30, 40 fish each throughout the day. And it was amazing. <clears throat> yeah, this lake here we're on, you need to know we're in the middle of nowhere. We're 20 miles back in there and in Wyoming, the only thing you may see is some loner rancher's place clear off the road about five miles. So when you come up here, please be careful. Bring, uh, the wind comes up quick, the snow's loose because it's cold and it's gonna blow and you're gonna have ground blizzards and country you don't want to get stuck in. Nope, and I've actually been stuck out here twice. Mark's pulled me out both times, today being one of them. Huge snow drift, couldn't make it across, it got completely stuck. So make sure you bring a jack, an extra tire, a lot of pop tires happen shovel. on this road, a shovel to dig yourself out, a tow strap. Just Wyoming can be harsh, so be prepared. Yeah, we don't usually get a lot of ice, not like South Park. The wind keeps it pretty buffed. I mean, we're at uh, about 8,000 feet, so uh, the wind keeps it buffed. And if you look around, it's beautiful. The water is just crystal clear. I mean, sight fishing, you guys would go nuts watching this fish go by. So I think we're gonna go out to deeper water. We came in around the weed line see if when we picked up a couple nice fish lost a couple and we're gonna go out and try to fish the plankton level so we'll suspend a little bit and then come back in in the afternoon so we can get some walleye sounds like a good plan mark well thanks for us having us out here in wyoming once again and uh let's get back to the fishing thanks brother